Dungeons project is looking at the genomes of 2,500 people to find human genetic variation. This is places in the DNA where people differ from each other, and the goal of this is, is the data from this project will be used to find genes that affect disease. I frequently think of Thousand Genomes as a Lewis and Clark expedition to the interior of the continent. We knew the outlines and the contours, we, we understood where the major rivers and the bays were, but what we're doing now is kind of systematically kind of walking through the interior into uncharted territory of um, rare variants. The idea behind the Thousand Genomes Project is to build a map of human genetic variation down to frequencies of about a percent in most of the populations around the world. Some genetic variation is very common, things like ADO blood type. The variants that contribute to that are in every population. If you look at any one population or any population, you'll find those genes. But some variants are much rarer or rare and found only in specific populations. So in order to get a good picture of human genetic variation, you have to look at a lot of people. So the project actually oversaw the collection of net, what is now a collection of 2,500 individuals from 26 different population groups around the world, all with informed consent that allows this open sharing of data. And then the project has put together these sequencing methods and technologies with these DNA samples and is producing an unmatched catalog, at least to date, of genetic variation in human beings around the world. We are building that catalog of what normal looks like and, and so it's available for a lot of disease studies to use immediately. The main findings were, first off, the amount of variation. There's 40 million variants in that paper, uh, which is a very large number of variants across these 1,092 people. The things I found most surprising were to do with the number of uh, apparently bad mutations that we all carry. So, you know, there are these catalogs out there which try and list mutations that have been through um, you know, clinical uh, labs as being identified as pathogenic. We are all walking around with you know, between two and five of these mutations, but you know, most of us are apparently healthy. The other thing that was found, and this is not unexpected, but this actually gave the details of that, is common variants, variants that are frequent in any one population, are frequent in all populations. Again, this reflects our common shared ancestry from Africa. I think another really important finding is that these rarer variants, and these are the ones that you know, we might think of as being more likely to cause more severe diseases, they're very structured geographically, which means that the rare variants that you find in the UK are different from what you find in uh, Italy or Germany or the US. Um, so there's quite strong geographical re restriction of these very low frequency, possibly quite bad for you mutations. So that when you're looking at an individual who's got a disease, you really need to take into context their local genetic background the geographic ancestry, essentially, of these individuals. And that has real implications for how you design disease studies, because a lot of people want to, say, to be efficient with money, and of course NIH appreciates that. A lot of people want to use a shared control group and then look at their disease study, their autism, the type 2 diabetes, arthritis, against a common disease group. But it turns out, because of this differentiation in rare variants, and because a lot of people nowadays are interested in understanding how rare variants contribute to disease, you can't take one population and study diabetes in it and a different population and use that as your control group because those rare variants will result in a lot of false positives. You'll get wrong results if you do that. So that means you have to be very careful how you design your studies so that you match your control group very carefully with your case group. But actually, genetic variation in its own, on its own doesn't make a huge amount of sense. It's not wildly interesting. It only makes sense in the light of the phenotypes that we can collect, what people look like, what diseases they're going to get, how they respond to different drugs. So there's a couple of ways in which Thousand Genomes data are being used. The data can be used to support studies 
of the genetic variants found in the Thousand Genomes Project for their role in disease. So you look through the whole genome, you look for regions that differ in frequency between people with a disease, people without disease, and those are regions that you want to follow up on because they're quite likely to contain genes that will contribute to the disease risk. In many of our diabetes studies, we've identified common genetic variants that are associated with risk of type 2 diabetes. There are actually now over 50 such regions of the human genome that have been identified as contributing somehow to diabetes risk. But in very few of these do we actually know the causal mutation in that uh, gene region that is actually why or how that gene region contributes to disease. And because before the Thousand Genomes Project and other sequencing studies, we only had a partial list of the genetic variants in each of those regions, it was like trying to find the needle in a haystack without having the ability to see all the pieces of hay and the needles. So what you can do is instead of having to sequence all these people, you can look in the database and look at Thousand Genomes data and say, okay, in these regions, this, these are all the variants, almost all, as I say. It's not going to find every last one, but it's almost all the variation in that region, which means each study doesn't have to sequence its own people. It can just go to the computer and find most of the variation that's there. Got a colleague here who's interested in multiple sclerosis. He picked up on a gene that had, pulled, had been pulled out of genome-wide association study. Uh, he looked in the thousand genome data and found that there was a variant that seemed to be explaining most of the signal. The thousand genomes data set um, for phase one is on the order of 180 terabytes. Um, so that's a 180,000 gigabytes. Remember, uh, DVD is four gig, right? So to take 180,000 and divide it by four, and that's how many DVDs worth of data we have. It is by far uh, the largest public bioinformatics data set in the world. A number of different sequencing technology companies have been active participants in the project, and many different sequencing laboratories around the world have employed these different methods. And together, the project has worked to make it so that it's much more practical than it was to take data with one machine or one lab and make it compatible and comparable to data generated at a different time with a different machine in a different lab. That might sound very easy, but it turns out to be extremely difficult. So once you take the raw sequence reads, you have to map them onto the genome. You then have to call variants, uh, point places in the DNA where people differ, called SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms, are more or less easy to make calls on. Structural variants, where there's an insertion or a deletion, or a piece of the DNA has flipped over, or a piece of the DNA has moved over there, or it's been copied, copy number variants, those are actually much harder to deal with. And so there's a very active part of the analysis group talking about structural variants. I think the Thousand Genomes Project has been the driving project for working out how to sequence human genomes. So an interesting thing about this project is that there's been huge numbers of analysts from a lot of institutions. Some of them have come from the sequencing centers, but many of them come from various other places in the U.S., in Europe, and China to work on these data. And so the group has an analysis group call every week. And so many, many people have been working very cooperatively to produce the data set. Just within this last year, there have been over 5,000 institutions around the world, um, over 2,000 in the United States and 3,000 everywhere else that have downloaded parts of 1,000, at least some part of 1,000 genomes. There are uh, research universities and teaching hospitals that maintain copies of everything. I think the legacy of these projects are, are numerous. One is that we will have succeeded, I think, in making sure that our shared genetic heritage and our ancestry and the DNA variants we carry are freely available for researchers to use to benefit patients around the world. There was a time 10 years ago, and there's always this tendency, where some said maybe we should patent all these and lock them up so we can uh, individually profit from that. But we tend to think that these uh, genetic variants belong to all of us. They're not, they're not inventions. They're simply things we carry and they should be available. I think when historians look back on the Thousand Genomes Project, they'll see it primarily as a driver for turning 
the idea of whole genome sequencing for personal medical use into reality. It was the key defining moment in making that happen because it, it, it's been a catalyst for getting the technology together, getting the resource together that can tell us what genetic variants are out there so that we can interpret those in, found in a specific individual.